Please. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to speak before this very esteemed audience. I'm humbled to speak about my personal experience. Uh, personal philosophy. There is no cure for Dupuytren's contracture. Achieving perfection is not necessary, though it's always our goal. Patients appreciate rapid recovery. Patients appreciate improvement of function, increased range of motion, even if their finger is not perfectly straight. Minimally invasive treatments that I'm going to speak about today offer lower morbidity, morbidity and less risk compared to open surgery. I, my personal emphasis is to treat early and repeat treatment early for recurrences. I think early treatment has the highest efficacy, the lowest recurrence rate, and there's less scarring of the PIP joint when you can get that PIP joint early, probably less than 45 degrees. I do not believe the old paradigm of 30, wait till it's 30 degrees and then come back is appropriate. Uh, patients should be treated early and aggressively. General principles for both treatments are first to confirm uh, that a cord is present. The cord needs to be palpable and causing the contracture. Uh, this is a patient that's had five, six procedures already, but does have a palpable cord which can be released. Cannot be scar or flex a tendon. Uh, when there's insufficiency to pulley system, the, the tendon can move palmally and you can be fulled. Uh, patients should have reasonable expectations with a clear understanding of the side effects and risks. I like to provide educational materials, videos to my patients so they understand what they're in for, regardless of what procedure they choose. I like to map out all the cords with a marker, regardless of which either technique, including natatory cords, commissural cords, and the ADM cord. Cords are superficial. They're only two to four millimeters beneath the skin, usually. I like to find the best areas to release the cord, supple skin, never in the flexor tendon, flexor crease of the fingers, and try to find the area of maximum bow stringing. And I think those of us who have had the experience of doing fasciectomies for years have a pretty good visualization of the three-dimensional anatomy, and I think that's very important uh, when you're ready to stick collagenase or a needle into the hand. Carefully explain the side effects uh, with collagenase. Patients should expect all the things that were presented yesterday by Larry and Marie. Uh, if you list them all to the patients, then they, when they only get one or two, they're, they're a lot happier than if you don't mention they get an axillary nodule and they get one and they call you at three in the morning, why do I have a lump under my armpit? When you draw up the collagenase, you need to confirm that the drug is truly in the syringe. On the left, you can see a tiny bubble uh, close to the hub. On the right, that one's all air. Uh, I can guarantee you from personal experience that air does not release a cord. I like to use anesthesia for injection and manipulation. Two 10C syringes of 1% xylocaine plane with or without bicarb. I use wrist blocks, palma blocks, digital blocks, dorsal blocks, PIP blocks, or whatever I need to do so the patient doesn't hurt. For, in, for injecting the collagenase, maintain tension on the cord. It's critical to maintain tension at all times to maximize the bow stringing. Choose those areas of maximum bow stringing for injection. Inject cords at the safest angle, injecting away from the flexor tendon sheath. For both techniques, I use the pinch and poke technique. I pinch the cord, palpate the cord, and inject between my fingers. Inject wide cords transversely. Really important concept. We're always taught to go longitudinal with our aliquots, but it's very important, especially for an MP and PIP contracture. I like a T-shaped injection transversely for those large cords over the proximal phalanx. For wide cords, I inject the base of the limb and up both legs uh, to try to get release of both fingers at one time with one dose, as you can see on the right. And keep in mind the safe zone. Four millimeters from the proximal finger crease, a proper proximal digital crease, two to three millimeters in depth. That is the safe area for injections. Yes, you can go beyond, but that is truly the safe area, especially if you not, don't have a lot of experience. Watch the distance between the hub of the needle and the skin at all times. There's a tendency when you inject to push the needle in. 
that could be catastrophic. If you penetrate dorsally, don't pull back and inject. Remove it from the cord, replace the needle into the cord in a different location. You do not want to drive the collagenase out dorsally where the flexor tendon is. Uh, I divide my aliquots into at least three, uh, sometimes six or seven, as you can see the picture on the bottom. I've always manipulate after 24 hours, generally. Uh, there's no reason to do it at 24 hours, as you heard yesterday from multiple papers. Uh, the advantage of manipulating after 24 hours is your ability uh, to have the hand less swollen, less bruised, less tender when you touch it. Uh, prep first. I put a little uh, alcohol on the hand. Cover prospective areas of skin tear with a gauze. Uh, we all have learned that from experience. My ceiling has seen blood. Not anymore. Because uh, skin tear is a common average 14 to 20 percent, and multi-cord study, 22 percent. Uh, manipulate the finger, not just into extension, but abduction, adduction, pronation, supination, all the different angles release all the cords, and don't forget to, to also manipulate the surrounding digit. If it's a ring finger contracture, manipulate the little finger and the middle finger. That will increase your release. Percutaneous needle fasciotomy, needle aponeurotomy. That's my tool, a, 20, a 25 gauge needle, 5 eighths, 5 eighths length. Maintain tension on the cord. Change the needle frequently. These needles get dull. You're not looking to save a dollar or two by reusing the needle. I use 15 to 25 needles for one finger sometimes. Uh, I never hesitate to just take them. They're inexpensive. Uh, I use basically one needle per portal max, and I will constantly change it and have them opening needle after needle for me. I uh, choose the areas of maximum bowstringing. Portals are usually in the center of the cord, but for wide portals, five millimeters or more, uh, you can use parallel uh, portals on the sides. Intradermal anesthesia, this is not nerve block anesthesia, and communication is critical back and forth for the patient. Do you feel an electric shock? Do you feel an electric shock? Tell me if it's an electric shock. Pinch and poke. Pin, uh, pinch the cord, poke the needle between your fingers. That's the safest way. You know that you're in the cord and not skiving off in the neurovascular bundle. The needle is aligned with the bevel perpendicular to the cord. That allows the cutting action. Flex and extend the finger to confirm that the needle is not in the flexor tendon. If you've done a bunch of these, it's probably not critical for every insertion. And select areas farthest from the neurovascular bundle. You can release PIPs, you can release DIPs. You just need to be cautious, slow, and careful. Clear, perforate, and slice. Those are the three techniques. Thank Charlie for his animation. Uh, release perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the cord. Apply gentle extension tension on the cord during release. And it helps to massage the cords. You can do this for collagenase as well. Especially narrow lateral cords respond very well to a little needle and then some massage. It's also very good for natatory cords. You don't feel like you have a total release, but by massaging it, rubbing back and forth, you can feel the crackling and the release. Again, manipulate in extension, adduction, abduction, pronation, supination. You're going to need to get all the cords released, manipulate the unaffected adjacent fingers. After you're done, reassess the palm. Go, I go proximally to distally, traditional Lemiso technique, uh, but go back into the palm, regardless of what technique you use. Look for residual cords. Natatory cord is a slicing motion proximal to distal, not only to radial, like a regular cord. And I inject nodules. My syringe was filled with 3 cc's, 1% salicane plane, 1 cc of depimedrol, 40 milligrams. So I inject the nodules afterward. Inject PIP joints for severe contractures before you manipulate. There's often a non-palpable central cord. You've got, the, you got that PIP joint released. You release the radial and ulnar cord, ADM cord. You can't quite get that PIP out by sticking a needle superficially in the midline, proximal to the middle finger crease. Don't enter the flexor tendon sheath, and you can feel little fibers cutting as you go back and forth, and that can sometimes be enough to get this completely released. I tried to show it in the picture. 
Also look for a hidden retrovascular cord. I had a case last week that the PIP did not release, and it kept feeling and feeling, and there was a retrovascular cord that allowed the PIP to release completely. General principles. We heard a lot about splinting yesterday. I'm a splinter. I have no evidence. I splint for three to four months. I admit it. I'm ashamed, even though I'm in a minority. I use static and dynamic splinting. Uh, static splinting, a night splint. That was my answer yesterday. If you have an active extension leg at the PIP joint, which is probably a stretch central slip, I will use uh, dynamic splinting as per Philadelphia technique. Uh, skin splits, lacerations, does not matter whether it's from needle or from collagenase. No suture, no graft, no flap, local wound care. They can get it wet in the shower. It does not matter. They will all heal in two to four, maybe the max five weeks. If you don't let it dry, it won't die. So if you have an exposed flexor tendon, keep it moist, and the tendon will never have a problem. In conclusion, there's no cure for Dupuytren contracture. No matter what procedure is chosen, the disease may recur. Until a genetic or disease-modifying treatment can be found, I encourage you to try minimally invasive treatments. These treatments offer excellent efficacy, significant improvement in range of motion, a low complication rate, and most important, especially for my patients, especially mothers, workers, sports enthusiasts, it's a quick recovery. These patients, within a week or two, can go back to full activity, sport, and their life. And I think that may, means a lot to them. In conclusion, there's a couple of bad collagenase cases, a couple of bad needle cases. No matter which technique you use, if you get good at it, you can get phenomenal results. Thank you.